What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. Welcome back to America Trends. Larry Rifkin along with John Kropsik. And John, you and I just can't get enough of financial meltdowns. I no, mean, well, somehow. I mean, let's let's face it. You know, we're we're potentially looking at another one. I mean, if, the, you know, they got all these indicators, everybody, yet the economy is still getting good. So, yeah, but it's always in the back of our mind, right? I mean, it's... What goes up? Must come down. Oh, that's oh, painful. It is I painful. Say. And the but last I, one was pretty bad. Oh, that was horrible. And I don't think we still have um, shaken off all of the impacts of the last crisis in the 09-10 area. When you think about it, John, and many people think that it was really an American event. I think that's the sense that we all get. Yeah. Because many of these multinational banks uh, are housed here in the United right. States. Well, that's what I thought. I thought it was just us going. Of course, if we go down, being that our currency is used Across the globe. Across the globe. Then I guess, it, 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 you know, you don't think about it, but it does kind of pull everybody down. Well, there's no, there's no question that, you know, if it starts in America, it's like in America. If it starts in California, it's going eastward at some point. A That's trend, true. whatever it may be. Weather. Yeah, everything. anything. <laughs> so if America is in some kind of financial crisis, just assume that we're bringing along our brethren in Europe and Asia yeah. uh, because we are all interconnected. And look, we can put up any walls that we want, whatever it may be, but this world is now intertwined and particularly financial markets. But we were convinced of that, you and I, after we talked to Adam Tooze because he wrote the book Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the world. Yeah, this was an amazing story. So you got to listen to this one because I didn't realize really, I was, I was kind of pissed off at the bailouts and stuff and, and nobody going to jail and everything. But you know, there's a, there's a, well, no, that was, I know John was, he was really <laughs> upset. He said, somebody has got to end up in the slammer for this. Yeah. And who could disagree with him? But and no one did. Happened. No Nobody one did. did. No. I mean, come on. Well, and but they might have lost their seat at a wonderful restaurant like 21 possibly. in New York or something <laughs> might have happened that could uh, at least disrupt they their a, they comfortable lives. They didn't get a big bonus that year. Yeah, that year. Okay, no bonus. <laughs> that was it. That was it. But the, there's more to the story than, than we knew. Ah. The rest of the story. And that's what you expect to hear on America Trends. And that's what we are bringing you because uh, this gentleman really opened our eyes. And he reminded us that uh, America, in terms of saving the world, first of all, we brought it into peril in many ways, but we weren't alone. I mean, everybody else was being, well, just about as irresponsible as we were being here in the United States. That's true. Yeah. So then we started this contagion around the world. And of course, being the Americans that we are with the oceans, uh, you know, against our, uh, our borders, we didn't really think about what was going on in Ireland or Spain or any of these places that were being infected by all of this bad product <laughs> that was being <laughs> sent out around the globe. We it's, just, it, we it, didn't, it didn't occur to us. It's unbelievable. Isn't it's it? Just, it's just unbelievable how how it was allowed to happen in the first place. But uh, you know, I, I guess we can attribute that to our government anyhow for for handing out loans for you know people who couldn't afford loans and then packaging them so nice and neatly. Yeah, so they into look these like awful loans. little tranches where you didn't know where the <laughs> junk was and where the good stuff I was, mean, and people was were so unaware. Fun. It was so um, ugly, um, unbelievable. <laughs> so if you really want a sweeping examination of all of the global effects of America's enthusiasm for these subprime mortgages, 
it's really a rewriting of the conventional wisdom that went into all of our thinking about what happened in that perilous time. And he does such a remarkable job, John, because I never knew. I mean, the thing that probably startled me the most, and you'll hear him talk about this, is how much the central bank in the United States was really bailing out these other central right. banks in other parts of the world, but saying, look, we don't know what else we can do other than not doing what we didn't do yeah, they in were the in crash of, nine, of 29. They were Be- in our charter, uncharted waters. The scary part of though is, is we don't, we, we don't learn from these things that I, I don't think, and I, I think this comes out in this interview too, as I remember, we haven't really done anything to prevent this from happening again. Well, I think there are certain people who do feel that some of the stress testing and some of the uh, legislation that was passed uh, in the wake of all of this puts us in a little bit better place. But then again, because we're in a mode of deregulation, right. and I think Adam Tooze would tell us, wait, don't deregulate too quickly, because some of the deregulation of some of the earlier legislation that goes back in response to the 29 crash right. actually stood us in good stead for many years, the Glass-Steagall Act right, and so right. forth. So don't be so quick. Uh, now, look, in the process, I think a lot of people got swept up in this regulatory fervor, a lot of the community banks and the small banks and the small mutual banks, and maybe the burdens we placed on them were a little bit too onerous. But for the large banks, look, they can accept a certain amount of regulation, and frankly, they require it. They do. I agree. Well, we're going to be talking to Adam Tooze about the trouble that went transatlantic as a result of the crisis that we all have experienced. And don't forget about it. You have to keep your eye on the ball. However you're investing in the world, you've got to be diversified. You've got to make certain that you ask some more penetrating questions about uh, where your money is and how it's being utilized. And if it sounds too good to be true and you can get this kind of loan or that, (laughs) it is. It is. Crashed. How a decade of financial crises changed the world. And we're going to help you understand that world a bit better today on America Trends. Joining us on the line is Adam Tooze, and the book is called Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the World. And Adam, I had done a couple of other podcasts about the financial crisis of 08, 09. But I've got to tell you, the perspective that you bring to this, where you really widen our scope and you look at the entire world in terms of the implications, is truly a different way of looking at this. Because I think many of us, and maybe that's just our own uh, myopic view that everything starts and ends in America, but it was a much wider, broader uh, conflict in terms of uh, finances uh, all around the globe. Yes, it truly was. I mean, even at its heart, it's, it's an Atlantic, it's a North Atlantic crisis. So what makes the 2007-8 meltdown really unique in modern economic history, worse and more dangerous even than the Great Depression crises from 1929 through 33, is the fact that in the fall of 2008, the major banks in all of the major financial centers on both sides of the Atlantic simultaneously are at risk of collapse. And we really never have never seen anything like this before in, in economic history. So the banks, not just of the US, but of the city of London, of France, of Germany, of the Netherlands, were all on the line simultaneously uh, in, a, in a really extraordinary uh, simultaneous meltdown. And this is because they were all interconnected, really from the 1980s onwards, in the course of the liberalization of global finance, the transatlantic banking system had been stitched together. And these European banks were, were not just blowing an enormous real estate bubble at home, several times larger than the one that emerged in the United States in proportional terms in Ireland and in Spain, but they were also up to their necks in the American mortgage business. So they were basically acting, as we've always said that global corporations do, as local actors in the U.S. They were borrowing dollars on wholesale money markets and lending them to American mortgage borrowers, securitizing merrily away. They were big players in many aspects of the mortgage-backed security business. And so they are convulsed by this crisis. And when that happens, everyone else in global finance, anyone with a highly internationalized financial sector, one thinks particularly of 
South Korea, for instance, or Russia um, is really at risk because their banks too depend on dollar funding. And when you have the kind of bank run, the kind of panic in financial markets we saw in 2008, then no one could get money. What's remarkable, you remind us, we may not have seen all this or understood it at the time. And the fact that we didn't go over the cliff is the most remarkable thing. And is that because Ben Bernanke, along with uh, Tim Geithner and Hank Paulson, uh, they were all students. They knew what happened during the Great Depression, and they were determined to take what you consider to be some pretty convulsive and uh, very independent action, uh, not only to paper over the problems in America, but all around the European sector as well. Yes, I mean, I, I should I think get into too much of a sort of superhero vision of the American crisis fighters. They stumbled into this. They were as much driven as they were drivers, and their colleagues in Europe and Asia followed suit quite quickly on the truly essential elements of crisis fighting, which is providing lender of last resort functions from the central bank. So taking illiquid assets off banks' balance sheets and making sure they've always got plenty of cash. But I think broadly speaking, I would agree with you that this is a one of those instances where we can say that technocrats learn from history, or at least one could say that there was one mistake they were definitely not going to repeat. And the mistake they weren't going to repeat was the mistake which we attribute to the Federal Reserve during the Great Depression of the 1930s, which is that it allowed bank failures. And it allowed bank failures not just once, but several waves of bank failures, bank failures that accumulated and in the end by 1933 reached New York itself. And the effect of that was to shrink the money supply, to shrink the volume of credit available to the economy. And I think we all generally agree that that contributed to deflationary pressure and there's really nothing worse for a modern economy, a credit-based economy, than large-scale sustained deflation. So that is one thing that they were determined to avoid. Now, they then sort of, you know, worked their way into a whole host of new problems, but and they didn't, one has to say, um, understand the forces that had been unleashed by the liberalization of capital markets and banking from the 1980s onwards. But once it became obvious that we were tumbling towards that kind of a crisis, they did indeed act on a historically unprecedented scale. And many of these big banks and these various actors, as you say, were not regulated in ways that were necessary to keep them from some of these excesses. Uh, have we learned at all from what happened in that period? Because all we hear today, the mantra is deregulate, deregulate. Yeah, this is a very disappointing turn of events. And I think there are few people, I mean, even, you know, amongst responsible Wall Street actors who well as who don't, I think, regard this as a as a dangerous trend, to be honest. We did learn. You know, certainly there was no radical action. You know, anyone from the from the left or indeed from the populist right who would have hoped to see the Wall Street crisis of 2008 or in Europe result in a fundamental structural change of the banking system will have been disappointed. The biggest banks in America, the biggest three, are even larger than they were before the crisis. So if there was a too-big-to-fail problem before, there certainly is now as well. The difference, I think, is that a determined effort was put in to try and make those banks safer than they were. And you do that in fairly obvious ways. You basically enforce them to hold more capital, which makes them less, you know, makes their rate of return on capital lower because they've got more capital to earn a return on. It makes them safer. So, you know, they shouldn't have to offer their shareholders much, uh, so such a high rate of return. You try and ensure that they match short term liabilities with short term assets so that if things go wrong, they can unwind their balance sheet. So you regulate various types of, of securities market and derivatives market. You try and make them more transparent so that you can see some of the dynamics unfolding there. Uh, you make it more expensive to engage in the sort of very short term financing that the banks were engaged in uh, before the crisis. And all of this has been done. And as a result, the banking business is quite transformed. And if not in the United States in a truly radical way, then in Europe, in certain parts, at least really quite considerably. So Switzerland is the most dramatic example, which before the crisis had two very large, very dangerous banks, UBS and Credit Suisse, and now has two much more reasonably proportioned banks, which are much less dangerous. They aren't exactly, you know, exact examples of either law abiding corporate citizens or necessarily, you know, vastly profitable enterprises, but they are at least much safer from the point of view of global financial stability. So there has been a change in the right direction. But it has to be said with the advent of the Trump administration, 
which is pursuing a policy with regard to American business, which just has to be described, I think, as cynical. There has been, I think, a sustained effort not to revise Dodd-Frank, because we, we've seen how difficult it is for the Trump administration to actually pass substantial legislation and on the legislative route, unwind the legacies of the Obama era and the crisis aftermath. But through changes on the inside of the machinery, above all at the Treasury, where Mnuchin has basically been operating a kind of hands-off regulatory system, that's, I think, where we're really seeing a step in the wrong direction. There are so many revelations in your book. I don't think most people aside from not understanding how global this was, would have uh, thought that Spain and Ireland had a housing bubble that was greater than the United States. You call it a thoroughly network crisis. You remind us that financial globalization really revolves around Europe, perhaps even more than the U.S. And finally, Mm -hmm. uh, the European financial leaders were really happy to pin the crisis on the U.S. And it was that told you so in the wake of the Iraq war. Go back and look at the, uh, you know, what led up to all of this and where America and Europe were in terms of their relationships with each other. Yes, I think it's important to say that um, it's important to stress how large the European financial bubble was, because otherwise, yes, all the way down to the very, you know, just last year, the year before last now, uh, 2017, the European Commission was merrily issuing anniversary press releases, repeating the old story that this was basically a bad case of the financial flu imported from the United States, which is just nonsense. Um, So there really is a tendency on the part of the Europeans to offshore this problem. In fact, their financial sector, as you were saying, was enormously overblown. In, with, you know, in relation to the size of the European governments and European states in which the banks are situated, it's vastly bigger than the United States. So you know, several European countries had big banks that had balance sheets that were multiples of their national GDP, and there isn't a single American bank that even comes close to that, because America's economy is so vast, which is part of what made the American bailout and restructuring the banks more effective. It's important, however, not to, as it were, then reimpose a, a national story on what is a transnational story. So it's important not to relabel this or rebadge this as European as opposed to American, because some of many of the players in the city of London, which is the hub here, are in fact the American banks, which are offshoring the most risky activities to London. So AIG, for instance, made the losses that crippled it in its London office. Uh, and big American banks like Lehman and so on would take the riskier part of their business and do it in London because the regulation was lighter there. So London, you know, I always quip, is is a bit like Wimbledon. You know, it's it's a global tennis event. It's hosted in Britain, but it's not about English tennis players. (laughs) And the same is true of of European Well, there's always Andy Murray. Well, there is, but no longer. And he's won, and he's, you know, won in in several decades drought. (laughs) So... You know, the story is about Spaniards and Americans and Germans and Swiss and Japanese. It's not it's not about your local heroes. And so this was really a, this is really the, the story of, you know, of globalization, of neoliberal market liberalization that we have been going on about and talking about for decades that was made real. And it was made real nowhere more intensively than in the financial sector. And some of those, some of the funding for that gigantic expansion of housing credit in Ireland and Spain that you were talking about um, came from American money market mutual funds. And this shouldn't be surprising, you know, because they look all over the world for the best possible rates of return to offer their investors. And, you know, a Spanish bank or an Irish bank or a Belgian bank lending to a Spanish borrower looks like a very safe proposition. Then it turns out they'll offer you a fraction of a percent of interest more than if you lend the same money to JP Morgan. So, you lend the money to a Belgian bank that's lending to a Spanish uh, borrower instead. And, you know, in the world of self-confident globalization of the early 2000s, that looked like a, you know, no risk deal. It was well within the comfort zone of globalization. And so what emerges is this transatlantic Euro-American system of credit expansion that drives these vast bubbles wherever things are hot. So, you know, we know it wasn't uniform across the United States. And if you compare Europe as a whole with the US, then Spain is a little bit like Florida, you might say, and Ireland's a little bit like some corner of the northeast of the United States. And so you might think of these as sort of regional surges, which in Europe happen to be within the boundaries of nation states, and in America happen to be within the boundaries of states or large economic areas like the Bay Area or something like that, but all driven by the same pool of credit expansion.
Let's go back and uh, take a look at uh, your feelings about the way the Americans did come in to handle this situation and comparing it to perhaps Colin Powell in his military strategy and uh, yeah. approach to uh, kind of shock and awe. What did the American decision makers do? And were you disappointed in the way the Europeans allowed this crisis to go forward and uh, really needed America's intervention? Yes. I mean, I think when I set out to write the book, which was in 2013, when Barack Obama had just been re-elected, and it looked as though the wheels were firmly on the bus, and I was basically, you know, I had narrative closure on this story, because the Eurozone crisis had also been capped off in the summer of 2012. That was one of my original intentions, was to wake up the Americans and the Europeans about the way in which this crisis was interconnected, and then indeed to make a comparison of the way in which the Europeans and the Americans fought the crisis. And without being triumphalist or too celebratory, it's clear that American crisis fighting was more efficacious in the first instance at a purely technical level. And if you ask why it is, within a relatively common framework of thinking about economic policy, fiscal balance, for instance, is one of the common agreed elements of economic policy on both sides of the Atlantic in the 1990s. The need for labor market liberalization and flexibilization, the need for emphasis on education as the driver of you know, long-run economic policy. In fact, the Europeans and Americans agree on most of the core elements in the 1990s. Why, out of that relatively similar uh, policy culture, quite different responses emerge in the in the crisis. If you're asking that question, then I think you have to kind of cast your net wider beyond the economic sphere and ask why is it that policymakers in America were willing to take these risks? Why were they willing to conceive of themselves as historic actors? And we've pointed to the legacies of history and the way in which Ben Bernanke and co. digested the experience of the 1930s. But it struck me that you know, the Iraq war and more generally American thinking about military power in the post-Vietnam era was also one of the resources, if you like, intellectually that these policymakers draw on. And if you read people like Larry Summers and Tim Guy, no, it's explicit. I mean, from the 1990s onwards, Larry Summers been banging on about the Powell Doctrine in crisis fighting, which he first expounded in with regard to Mexico in 94 and 95 in the Clinton administration. And the idea is before you get overwhelmed by the force of global economic events, go in hard with all the assets that you've got, all the resources that you've got, while simultaneously, and this is the core element of the Powell Doctrine, you don't get bogged down, you don't allow a Vietnam scenario to develop, you always have an exit strategy. So you go in hard, you go in fast, you go in with maximum force, and you plan your way out. And this was... You know, in terms of the way in which American policy thinkers think about their power and how they deploy it, I thought this was, well, it was very striking that economic policymakers would be drawing on this example. Hmm. And of course, that kind of language, that kind of repertoire of thinking about how you use power, which in the American case, believe it or not, goes back to German inspiration, but goes back to the inspiration of the German military thinker Karl von Clausewitz. Like, that's not available to modern day Germans. Hmm. You know, you're not going to find a finance minister of Angela Merkel's government spouting <laughs> Clausewitzian sound bites. Right? That's not that's a that's an intellectual resource, a political culture that's just not available to them. And so I think this is a rather interesting element of the difference. The Americans think operationally, if you like, in terms of forces that can be deployed, the opportunity to deploy them. The Europeans tend to think much more in terms of law, in terms of constitutions, how you build order. And that, in the crisis situation, is frankly a quixotic enterprise. Capitalism doesn't, in the end, yield to that kind of picket fence kind of vision of orderliness. And this is uh, an advantage, I think, the Americans have, you know, in that they're basically quite willing to abandon principle. Now, that has some downsides as you go down the road in terms of legislating and in terms of politics, but in terms of crisis fighting, it has obvious advantages. The book is called Crashed. Adam Tooze is with us. A remarkable look back at the financial crisis. You remind us of things that, uh, honestly, I don't think have ever been brought up uh, in, in most circles in America. For example, you say that other countries that had no responsibility for the crisis, Russia, Argentina, to South Korea, Australia, they had this uh, great stimulus that went on. And as much as there was great action, almost unparalleled action on the part of American economic 
economic decision makers, there was a lot of pushback. I saw the documentary recently on HBO where the leading figures look back, but I had forgotten there were many who were pushing back against anything they wanted to do, and they were coming back and back and back to Congress saying, unless you do something here, we're going over the cliff. No, absolutely. One shouldn't underestimate that, both at home and abroad. You know, I think it's difficult not to think of this in in terms of current politics. If you're looking for the moment when the Republican Party splinters into, as it were, a responsible, governance orientated and frankly big business orientated group and a let's call it by its name, a kind of know-nothing, populist, doctrinaire, catastrophist wing. And similarly, the Democratic Party splinters between a more mainstream centrist group and a more hardline leftist wing. 2008 is the moment where you see that coming true, and it's particularly over the TARP legislation of the fall of 2008, but already even over the bailout of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I mean, TARP is controversial because it involves basically propping up banks. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are, ba- Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are banks too, but they are the pillar of the American middle-class uh, home ownership society. And in the summer of 2008, the Congressional um, Caucus of the Republican Party basically told the Bush administration, look, don't count on us for votes. We're not going to vote through the measures that are necessary to stabilize Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which out without which the really the entire American mortgage system would cease to function all the way down to the present day. It depends essentially on Fannie Mae and Freddie Fat Mac, in fact, even more than it did before the crisis, because private securitization is basically, you know, is basically dead. So you you see at that moment uh, the assertion of an ideological, of an expressive, of an emotive kind of politics are willing to contemplate, you know, true catastrophe at the heart of American politics on both the right wing of the Republicans and the left wing of the Democratic Party. And I'm not going to make false equivalences here. In the end, it's the Democratic Party that provides the votes for a Republican administration of centrist Republicans to push through the stabilization of the American economy. When it comes to the Obama administration, they can't get barely a single Republican vote for the stimulus package of 2009 or for Dodd-Frank. So, you know, we're talking about a radicalization of American politics really driven from one side in the first instance, which is already evident in 2008-9, even under the, a Republican presidency, even at a moment of national peril. And that's before we go on to the, you know, the showdowns over the American government budget in 2011 and 2013. And this is feeding off and in dialogue with international criticism of the U.S., So you'll see this again and again when you look at the history of QE, Ben Bernanke's life-saving monetary stimulus from the central bank, that when he does this in 2010, you know, he gets huge pushback from conservative voices in the U.S. who are able to draw on the criticism which the U.S. is receiving, say, in the G20 forum from Germany, from China, all of whom are attacking America for its loose monetary policy. So there really is a kind of cross-national, transnational Uh, struggle going on here over the direction of economic policy, which in some ways prefigures, you know, always part of the polarization of party politics, which is such a dominant feature of the U.S. all the way down to the present day. You are able to tie so many loose threads together very quickly because we don't have a lot of time. You also look at this Wall Street bailout in this global context as giving rise to some of Putin's aggressiveness and to China's economic surge. Uh, Put that together for us. Well, I mean, the China case is the simpler one in the sense that China roars through the 2008 crisis. Uh, It barely misses a beat. Why? Because the Chinese state launches the single largest combined fiscal monetary expansion that we have seen in decades. It's up there with the great stimuli of World War II or the Stalinist or Mao era. I mean, an absolutely gigantic push. And so on the back of that, China in 2008 is the only economy, really, that is sustaining global growth. 2008 is the moment when the Chinese motor vehicle market overtook the United States as the leading auto market in the world. You know, on every possible indicator, this is the moment where really China uh, takes the reins. It's also, of course, the fall of the Beijing Olympics. Symbolically, Beijing becomes, as it were, the center of global attention. And all of this points forward to the moment in 2014 where once you adjust for the cost of living, purchasing power parity adjusted figures show that China's GDP is larger than that of the United States. So that overtaking story is happening. And this was anticipated before the crisis. It's accelerated by the crisis. And it shows in Beijing's, you know, self-confidence and assertiveness. Russia-
Russia is a more complicated story, and it it's it's it, it, it's a combination of geopolitical factors which were heating up before the crisis. It's easily forgotten that the summer of 2008 is also the first shooting war between Russia and a Western proxy in Georgia uh, in August 2008, because there had been a push to expand NATO and Putin was pushing back. But what's really crucial here is the relative power. Russia comes through the crisis not well because it's very hard hit, but it is actually able to maneuver its way through the crisis of 2008 intact because it has accumulated the world's third largest foreign exchange reserve through its oil exports and gas exports, not all of which flows back to Russia because of the oligarchs draining it, but a large part does. And this gives Moscow a room for maneuver. And that's very unlike the weak countries around it. And the weakest of all of these is Ukraine. So if you want to understand how Ukraine tumbles towards the instability of 2013, vacillating between the West and Russia, which then ultimately destabilizes its domestic politics, sucks the West in, and then provokes the aggressive reaction from Russia, the financial side of this story is absolutely crucial. And crucially, the difference between post-Soviet states and how they positioned themselves. Ukraine was basically a basket case dependent on external support. It was an accident waiting to happen. And the EU and the West were incredibly foolish for ever having engaged with Kiev, given Russia's attitude. And Russia, by contrast, boxes its way through these crises. It's no longer offering its population the prospect of very rapid economic growth, but it's certainly able to hold its own. And in that regional geopolitics, it's a heavy hitter and easily able to assert itself over the Ukraine, especially if Europe and the United States are not really willing to ante up and go all in and really try and push Russia out. So the, the finance is really a hugely underestimated element in the story of our increasingly difficult relations with Russia and Russia's mysterious ability, not so mysterious when you look closely, to defy our efforts to sanction it, bring it to heel. It really does have, you know, a float of somewhere between $350 billion and $600 billion. And if you combine that with a deployable military, a compliant population and a large arsenal of nuclear weapons, you're a global player. Fascinating. It really is. And thank you so much. If there's one book that you're going to read to really put in perspective what happened in 2008 and the implications for our politics today, I would recommend Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crisis Changed the World. Adam Tooze, thank you so much for being with us today on America Trends. Thank you for having me on. Hey, Larry, I got some exciting news. Well, let's hear it, John. We are not part of the MHNR Network. Really? Where can you find the MHNR Network? We can find us at mhnrnetwork.com. Let's go there right now. All right.